Okay, so in this video, we're going to talk about basically energy and metabolic pathways as just a general intro. Um, this is part of AP Biology's 3.4 topic, um, which kind of leads us into next photosynthesis and cellular respiration. So let's go ahead in general, talk about metabolism and what that means. So when you hear the words, um, you have a high metabolism or a fast metabolism or a slow metabolism, generally speaking, metabolism is the totality of an organism's chemical reactions. So basically, if you are adding up all of the chemical reactions within your body, that is your metabolism. And so when we think about um, metabolism, like one of the main things though is our mitochondria using our organic molecules, our carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins, and breaking them down for energy. And so um, when we talk about cellular respiration though, uh, it is basically a metabolic pathway. And photosynthesis is a metabolic pathway, but you also have um, things like the production of tryptophan in prokaryotes, that's a metabolic pathway. So when you see the words metabolic pathway, you should really think of, first off, because it's metabolic, we're talking about chemical reactions, um, but because it's a pathway, it's a series of steps. So if you were walking along a pathway, you would have a start and you would have a finish, but there would be multiple steps along the way. So in a metabolic pathway, you have a starting molecule and you have an ending molecule. And so um, each of these steps in a metabolic pathway is controlled by enzymes. So to act it out for you here at Animate It, so when we talk about like um, A is a substrate, then you have the first enzyme to convert it to a product, B, but B is now a substrate for enzyme number two, and then C is a product, but also a substrate for enzyme number three, and then you have your final product. So this is just three enzymes, um, but in reality, when we talk about metabolic pathways, like here in cellular respiration, glycolysis alone is um, like a pathway of 10 different chemical reactions, each controlled by their own enzymes. So with that here, glycolysis um, is one metabolic pathway, but then you have the Krebs cycle, which is eight steps involved um, in the Krebs cycle, each controlled by their own enzymes. Again, a metabolic pathway. And then you have the electron transport chain and each of those proteins in that chain are enzymes. So when you are asked about a metabolic pathway, you basically have a couple answer choices. You could say glycolysis, you could say fermentation, the Krebs cycle or citric acid cycle, the electron transport chain, or you could talk about photosynthesis with um, the light reaction or the Calvin cycle or the dark reaction. And so metabolic pathways are really coming down to um, a series of steps in a, in a pathway all controlled by enzymes. So uh, there are basically two kinds of metabolic pathways. We have our, hold on, let me get my dog to stop barking. Sorry about that. So we have two kinds of metabolic pathways. We have our um, catabolic pathways as well as anabolic pathways. So in a catabolic pathway, this is going to be um, an energy releasing pathway. So in the process of cellular respiration or aerobic respiration, what we're gonna do is we're gonna break down our sugar or our food in and in the process, release a lot of ATP. And so this catabolic pathway is an energy releasing pathway um, that breaks down complex molecules to simpler ones. So in cell respiration, we're breaking down glucose, which is pretty um, large for a molecule, and we're breaking it into carbon dioxide and water. Well, we form water, but we're breaking it into carbon dioxide. Um, and then we have anabolic pathways. And in an anabolic pathway, Basically, you're gonna consume energy to build um, something complex from simpler molecules. So a perfect example of this is photosynthesis and the dark reaction or the Calvin cycle, where in um, the second step of the second pathway of photosynthesis, the um, plant is going to do carbon fixation, where it's gonna take carbon dioxide from the air and along with 
the NADPH that was reduced during the light reaction uh, and some ATP also made during the light reaction. It's going to invest all of these molecules in some complicated steps and basically form G3P. Now G3P is like half a glucose, so you would need to have this do twice in order to make one single sugar. So in an anabolic pathway, you are taking simple compounds and requiring energy in order to build something. Okay, so I like, this is one of my favorite pictures from Google images, is you take some food and in that process we'll have catabolic uh, pathways to break things down. And then in that process though, you do release some heat in catabolic um, pathways. As we break down large molecules to simpler ones, heat is released. This is how endotherms do it. This is how we thermoregulate. So our metabolism generates our heat and we use that to keep us at, as humans at 30 degrees, 37 degrees Celsius or 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. So our body temperature is regulated um, through our metabolism as well as other homeostatic uh, mechanisms like sweating and shivering, etc. But generally speaking, we use our metabolic pathways to generate our heat and keep us at that constant temperature. So as you can imagine, if we're requiring food to generate heat to keep us at 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, we would require more food than an ectotherm or a cold-blooded organism. So um, an alligator, if you find an alligator of my same body mass, I would require way more food because I'm breaking that food down to produce heat where the alligator is going to be a cold-blooded organism and it's not gonna thermoregulate. Therefore, it doesn't use any food to generate heat. Okay, so that's a big deal, sorry. And then we have our anabolic pathways where we can require some energy and those building blocks to build larger molecules. Okay, so um, the two kinds, so those were pathways though. Like when we look at anabolic and catabolic, these are overall big pathways like cellular aspiration, photosynthesis, right? Um, but in each of those pathways, we talk about re chemical reactions. So each step in a pathway is a chemical reactions and we can have two kinds of chemical reactions. We can have exergonic, where energy is gonna be released, which in reality, it's not ATP, the energy that's released, but I just was using it as a visual. Or you can have an endergonic reaction that's actually going to um, require the input of energy, okay? And so, um, each step in a pathway is either going to be exergonic or endergonic. So when we talk about exergonic, if we talk about the potential energy that is in, um, a, in a reaction, during an exergonic reaction, it's going to release energy. So the amount of potential energy remaining is less than was in the products. Um, and then we have an endergonic. So here your delta G, the amount of free energy available um, would be less. And then we have our endergonic reactions. And in endergonic, that's energy requiring, so it has to have an input of energy. So the potential energy of that product is greater. Um, so it actually requires um, an input of energy, so your delta G will be positive. Okay. Um, so now let's talk about energy, though, and what do cells use? So uh, cells are going to use the molecule ATP. Um, and ATP is made of three parts. You have your adenine and your ribose, which together, like if you were to just ignore these two phosphates, that would actually be the A in RNA, like the, um, not A in RNA, but like the, um, um, like A pairs with U, C pairs with G, that A, the A adenine nucleotide has uh, adenine, ribose, and just one of these phosphates. But if we have three phosphate groups attached, this is actually our energy storage molecule. That's a very short-term energy storage, whereas like glucose or a lipid is like longer um, storage. So here, when we talk about ATP though, each of those phosphate, phosphate groups have a negative charge. So 
like repels like. So these negative charges are repelling each other. So to form those bonds, I want you to think about this as like trying to compress a spring. Like if I drop my remote or something and my the little cover pops off and then my batteries pop out, that's going to be um, like the spring is like releasing the energy or something. So here, um, this is like a compressed spring waiting to be like, like released or expanded. So we think that, well, how is that energy, right? Well, oh, let's stop right here. What we just did is we added a phosphate group to a molecule called ADP. So while this one is ATP, adenosine triphosphate, this is ADP, adenosine diphosphate. So when you add a phosphate to something, we call that phosphorylation. And so again, we phosphorylated ADP. So in cellular respiration and photosynthesis, we're going to look at substrate level phosphorylation, oxidative phosphorylation, and photophosphorylation. So again, and then later in unit four, when we talk about um, the cell cycle and we talk about kinases, um, and we talk about like activating enzymes and proteins, what we're doing is we're phosphorylating molecules. So when you hear the word phosphorylate, it basically means add a phosphate group to something. Uh, and kinases do that in our future units. Okay, so let's go ahead and um, talk about this. So we have energy stored in the bonds between the second and the third phosphate. So when ATP is hydrolyzed, so we want to go back to unit one and think about the words dehydration synthesis and hydrolysis. So here, in order to break off that phosphate group, we are adding a water and we're actually hydrolyzing the bond, like that hydrolyzing the molecule to break that bond. And so um, it's when we hydrolyze ATP that the energy is released and available to build other bonds in other molecules. So here, ATP is like a fully charged battery storing potential energy. However, when we hydrolyze it, we're left with ADP and a inorganic phosphate. Now that ADP still has some potential energy. It still has those two negative charges, just not as much. And so here, um, energy is stored when um, an inorganic phosphate is added to ADP. So that would be by dehydration synthesis. And this is um, uh, energy storing. What did I want to say? Oh, phosphorylation. We phosphorylated ADP. So now you have ATP is formed. However, when ATP is hydrolyzed, that means energy is being released. And now we're back to ADP and a phosphate. So this is like a, um, a cycle that happens millions of times in each of your cells. Uh, a lot of times students ask me, well, where does that phosphate come from? Like you literally have millions of these um, in your cytoplasm, in your cytosol, in your mitochondria, uh, and it's constantly forming and breaking. Now you can get more phosphates from your diet um, as part of the phosphorus cycle on earth, uh, but you do have a lot in our cells. Okay, so that is my kind of uh, summary and intro on metabolic pathways, as well as our discussion on energy. So good job. Oh, okay.